uh, thank you for being here with us. Um, welcome to our webinar. With that, I'm going to hand over the spotlight now to our uh, representative from Berkeley. We have Ali Hesse with us, who's the Associate Director of Com Communications, and she's going to take us through a little bit more about this larger ecosystem at Berkeley that you'll be joining when you join this program. Ali, thank you for being here with us. I'm going to hand the spotlight over to you now for next steps. Perfect. Thank you so much, Marie. And thank you everyone for joining us today for today's webinar, Intelligent Investing for Everyone. Um, as Marie mentioned, my name is Ali, and I'm excited to share a bit with you about UC Berkeley, the Haas School of Business, and Berkeley Executive Education. Uh, so as you can see in this first slide, this is a beautiful view of the San Francisco Bay uh, that you can see from the UC Berkeley campus. And this tall tower here is the Campanile Tower. And if you ever have the opportunity to come join us on campus, you can actually take an elevator to the very top of this tower and enjoy some 360 degree views of this UC Berkeley campus. Um, but as you can see here, UC Berkeley was founded in 1868 and it's located in the San Francisco Bay Area and it's the flagship institution for the 10 UC research universities, as well as five medical centers. And it has a student population of over 40,000 students across undergree, under, undergrad and degree programs. Um, and in the next slide, we'll look more specifically at the Haas School of Business. Thank you. So this is a picture of the Haas School of Business, which was founded in 1898 by a woman named Cora Jane Flood, and it's actually the second oldest business school in North America. Um, and there are currently six degree programs at Haas, as well as executive education. And all seven of these programs are ranked in the top 10 among public and private universities. And we'll look next at Berkeley Executive Education, which is a direct affiliate of the Haas School of Business. Um, so Berkeley Executive Education's mission is twofold and both involve you. The first is to create a positive impact on business and society. And the second is to extend the critical work of our faculty um, beyond the university and into the greater world. And we just want to thank you for your contribution to our ability in achieving this great impact and for your engagement in our programs. And next we will look at some of Berkeley Exec Ed's program offerings. Great, so here we have um, our program offerings, which you can also find directly on our website, but we have online programs and in partnership with Emeritus, we actually currently have 12 online programs. You can see a few titles here, um, but to find out more about the programs, you can visit our website. We also have open enrollment programs for individuals, which we do have in person soon and online. Um, and we offer our open enrollment programs in four different academic pillars, each very important to um, a well-rounded leadership education. So we offer programs in leadership and communication, entrepreneurship and innovation, strategy and management, and finance and business acumen. Uh, we also offer custom programs for organizations um, in, corporate, government, and university clients that are seeking to address challenges or opportunities within their organizations and industries. Um, and again, I encourage you to visit our website where you can learn more about these three different offerings we have. Um, and next we will look at our Certificate of Business Excellence. Thank you, Marie. Um, so after you complete this program, if you're interested in pursuing additional programs with executive education, you're eligible to earn your certificate of business excellence. And that is really an opportunity to earn a mark of distinction from a world-class university by really pulling together a customized learning journey with us. Um, and in order to complete your COBE, we call it, uh, you will need to complete one program in at least uh, in each of the four academic pillars that we see on the screen here. Um, and you will need to complete at least 17 days of program curriculum. And um, you have three years from the start of your first program to complete your COBE. Uh, so this program, as well as most other emeritus online programs, is equivalent to two COBE days. So if after you complete this program, you choose to pursue COBE, you'll already have two of your 17 days complete. Um, and there are many benefits uh, to completing your COBE. 
One is on-site public access to the business library and other university databases. You'll get a one-year online subscription to the California Management Review, um, a UC Berkeley Haas forwarding email address, as well as a, a, a private invitation to our exclusive network of Haas alumni. Um, after completing the first program with us, you'll actually also be eligible for a 15% alumni discount, and those who complete all of the COBE requirements will be eligible for a 30% discount on future eligible open enrollment programs. Um, so next slide, we'll look at our defining leadership principles, which are really drive everything we do at Berkeley Executive Education. And the Berkeley Haas defining leadership principles were codified by former Dean of Haas, Rich Lyons. And as you can see here, they are question the status quo beyond yourself, confidence without attitude and student always. Um, so we really embed these design, defining leadership principles in everything we do in our programs and at, at Exec Ed. Um, and without further ado, I would like to pass it on to the program faculty, Panos and Omri, who will walk you through the program um, and tell you a bit about themselves. So thank you so much. Ali, thank you very much for the introduction. That was great. It's always a great reminder to be part of the number one public university in the world. And, and uh, I'm very happy to be kicking off this program with Omri, my friend and colleague at uh, Berkeley Haas. Uh, so a little bit about myself so that you know what uh, you might be getting into. I'm an associate professor in the LH Penny Chair in Accounting at Berkeley Haas. I've been at Haas for the last uh, almost 11 years. And my specialization is capital markets research with a twist. So we're trying to create intellectual arbitrage opportunities by intersecting ideas from accounting, law, finance, and economics, and try to get a better understanding how people make investment decisions and how they use financial data for intelligent decision making. Uh, the program, our program has been, uh, you know, was born organically, and you'll see that, you know, throughout this presentation. Um, and I want to pass it over to my friend Omri and uh, um, uh, to introduce himself. Hey everyone, uh, welcome to the webinar. Thank you for being here today. I know everyone is at a different time zone, it seems like. So for some of you it's morning, for some of you it's night. So glad you can join us. Uh, as Panos mentioned, my name is Omri Ivantov. I'm an assistant professor also at the Haas Accounting Group. I've been here for the last six years. Uh, most of my research is focused also on capital markets. I also do some stuff about fintech, uh, ESG, environmental, social, and governance, mergers and acquisitions, and some other stuff in, among those. Uh, but what I love to do is, is teaching, and I think the best kind of courses are the ones that really challenge you and that keep you ahead of the game with the latest innovations in the market. And that's kind of how Panas and I structure this course, is to really find you know, what is going on in the markets these days and both walk you through, you know, from past to today and also see what's going to happen in the future as well. And I've been very lucky to be at Haas uh, and, you know, it was also a good reminder to, you know, kind of uh, where we're situated at the moment. And, and I'll uh, pass it back to Panos to tell you a bit more about the program and I'll, I'll uh, join in a bit later. So together, Omri uh, and myself, we've dedicated over almost 20 years in financial education and this program is reflecting uh, many of the things that we've learned over this last 20 years through our research and teaching. We love research and we love our teaching and over the last several years we had thousands of MBA students uh, at Berkeley House through a variety of program offerings and we believe that this program offering is kind of distilling some of the key ideas, some of the first principles that are relevant to individual investors not just those that have financial acumen, but especially those that don't have the financial acumen, but they need a framework to think about financial data and use financial data for intelligent uh, decision making. We believe that the time is optimal over the last uh, 18 months or so with the onset of the, of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we saw increased participation of individual investors in capital markets. Uh, access to uh, uh, the stock market has been facilitated by the rise of trading platforms, uh, online trading platforms that make it really easy for everyone effectively to open up an account and start buying and selling securities. But Omri and I believe that access to the stock market and access to trading 
is not the same as democratizing capital markets. And I think this is where the program is coming in. We're gonna be in the business in the journey of democratizing intelligent decision-making for everyone, not just those who have the financial acumen and expertise, but effectively everyone. Uh, the way we're gonna try to do that is through a combination of lectures and cases. Um, the primary ideas, I think, underpinning the structure of the program first, is this idea of moving from analysis, which is the specialized knowledge of a specific discipline, to synthesizing ideas across different disciplines, from accounting to finance to economics uh, to machine learning to computer science. And you'll see some of these ideas uh, are being blended together in this program offering. And the same uh, axis uh, around which this program is organized is this idea of moving from uh, a theory to practice. So, you know, through the lectures, uh, we're going to give you the framework, a way to think about things. And then in the live sessions and through the case and exercises, you're going to have the chance to apply these ideas in practice. And I think by the end of the program, um, uh, you're going to have a very strong, powerful framework for intelligent dis investment decision making that you can build up on over time and use in practice. But Panos, let me just uh, chime in. I think at the end of the day, if you think about it, the goal of the class is to provide you with the tools that's necessary to make the informed financial decision. So even if you consider yourself as a sophisticated investor and executive in a company, we're sure that it can fit everyone. Uh, this is exactly the type of program that we built for it. And we're sure that this will supplement um, you know, your, your current education because we're going to go in depth into a lot of different areas that are current in the markets. And we supplement the program with real world cases that really make you think about the implementation just beyond the theory that we're also gonna cover. Excellent, so perhaps we can provide a very quick overview of some of the takeaways, and then we're gonna take a deep dive on each individual module, and we have eight of those. So in terms of the key takeaways, the way we think about it is by the end of the day, at the end of the day, you're gonna be able to use financial data in creative, constructive ways in practice to make decisions, to make investment decisions. Um, uh, we're going to try to understand what's driving value creation, how uh, data has been reflected by investors in the stock market, how we can use data to formulate investment strategies, how sophisticated investors are using data at the expense of less sophisticated investors, uh, and of course, how we can use data in general to have a better understanding of how the stock market and capital markets operate in practice with the objective to improve decision making. Again, uh, we don't uh, have any prerequisites uh, uh, coming into the program. Everything we cover, we're going to cover it in enough depth uh, uh, for you to be able to sort of follow along the way. And we're going to make sure that nobody falls behind uh, during the program. And by the end of the program, uh, I believe that everybody's going to be better off in terms of getting access to this powerful framework uh, for financial data analysis uh, and informed decision making. Uh, a, a very quick overview of the modules, and then we're going to take a deep dive on, on, on the specifics. Uh, we have eight modules. Um, next, next slide, please. Uh, we have eight modules, um, and uh, you know there's going to be live sessions in between. Uh, the first four modules, uh, it, it's going to be uh, I'm going to be leading the discussion, and the, and the second part of the program, Omri will be leading the discussion. But of course, the two parts of the program are inexorable tied to each other and we're building upon each other. Uh, we're gonna start with the idea of what's driving value creation all the way to how to use data to analyze company performance, how to formulate trading strategies. And then Omri will show you how uh, financial technology, the intersection of finance and technology is, uh, is um, disrupting the way we think about finance and access uh, uh, to capital markets. So now with that, I can start uh, uh, kind of diving into the specifics of each module. Uh, so for the next four slides, I'll talk about the first four modules and then Omri will pick it up for there. So starting with module one, uh, the fundamentals of corporate value creation, the idea will be very simple. What's driving value creation? How can value be created? What's, what's the mystery of corporate value creation? How do the different value drivers, growth and profitability come together for value to be created. Um, in the process, as we try to understand the drivers of value creation, we'll try to understand how the stock market 
is processing information and how market prices reflect corporate fundamental value drivers. We'll talk about the efficient market hypothesis, which is the theory that connects prices to value. And then we're gonna sort of take a deep dive and try to understand when prices deviate from fundamental values and ways we can identify potentially interesting uh, ideas uh, from an investment point of view, cases where prices are more likely to deviate from fundamental values. Um, of course, we'll talk about the role of financial data analysis in theory, but also in practice. And there's gonna be an application that accompanies the module. In terms of module two, um, module two will of course build on the first module and the objective of module two will be to use historical data, data from the financial statements to assess the history path of corporate value creation in terms of growth and profitability, the two pillars of value creation. Really the idea would be to introduce a framework for structured forecasting, use historical data and then use the data in creative ways to try to anticipate what might happen moving forward. You'll see during this module that different disciplines are coming together from accounting, which is the use of accounting data from the financial statements to finance and economic theory, which is gonna help us identify what's driving value creation to all the way to statistical techniques that allow us to use the historical data in creative ways uh, with the objective to try to anticipate what might happen in the future. Now, module one and module two will be extremely important in terms of setting up the stage for the rest of the program because it will give you the foundation, the theory, and also a ton of opportunities for uh, uh, practical applications. As a matter of fact, the exercise or the application that comes with module two is a real-time, real-life analysis of the financial statements of a real company, which we're not gonna disclose now, uh, but there's gonna be a few of them actually. Uh, and, and the idea will be for you to sort of get the framework from the, from the lecture and then use the framework and apply the framework in real time to get a better sense of what's driving value creation and try to anticipate the future of the corporation. Now, of course, all of this is important because at the end of the day, the market will be trying to do the same exercise. And to the extent that some of us can do the forecasting exercise better than others, that can lead to more intelligent investment decision making. In terms of module three, um, uh, we're gonna gradually be progressing to more advanced topics. And the idea will be to talk about financial engineering. Financial engineering will be organized around the idea of corporate share transactions. For example, over the last few months, there's been a frenzy around GameStop and AMC and some of the meme stocks that have experienced a rapid increase in their stock prices and the question for the corporate insiders has been, hey, maybe this is a really good time for us as a company to actually raise capital and try to finance future growth uh, and be opportunistic in terms of the way we uh, kind of transact with capital markets. So we'll talk about buybacks, cases where corporations buy back shares, cases where corporations issue shares for the first time or the second time or the third time and we'll talk about market timing, cases where managers, smart managers, time the market opportunistically to exploit periods of mispricing. And of course, that's gonna be really important because these managerial transactions, right? When a company buys back shares, when a company issues shares, is a signal that others can interpret in creative ways. So when a company, for example, when AMC decided to issue new shares a couple of weeks ago, that was a signal that was disseminated to the public capital markets. And now the question is how should individual investors be reacting to these announcements, right? So financial engineering will be a fascinating module. We'll talk about corporate share transactions, market timing, and ways individual investors, outside investors can actually translate these signals into actionable initiatives. Now, moving on to module four, Module four, we'll talk about the long and short of financial data analysis. And without getting too much into the details, one of the primary ideas will be the following. In a neoclassical framework, prices and value are typically close to each other. So there is no really opportunities to exploit times of overpricing or mispricing or underpricing. But in reality, what we see in the data is that there is systematic deviations of prices from fundamental values. 
not for every company, not at all times, but for certain segments of the market. So let me give you an example. Think of cryptocurrencies, right? So cryptocurrencies and other kind of uh, digital assets. Well, these are assets that are really hard to understand, even for the experts, right? And really hard to value and really hard to arbitrage in many cases. And the combination of this, you know, this difficulty of understanding with limits to arbitrage tends to create conditions of overpricing, conditions of bubbles, right? So we'll see the same, you know, with real companies, companies that are hard to understand, that are more speculative, and that are also hard to arbitrage, will be more prone to overpricing. And we're going to see ways, creative ways, to use financial data to identify these more speculative companies that are more prone to overpricing in real time. And that's going to be very interesting and very important from an individual investor protection point of view, because to the extent that you can identify those cases in real time, well, you can sort of act, not sort of, but you can definitely preserve your wealth and avoid making mistakes that other investors usually do, right? So we can use theory and data to help you understand, you know, which cases are more prone to mispricing more prone to overpricing and ways you can preserve your wealth and avoid making mistakes that other investors typically do. And what we see over the last few months, there is a, a, a need for a framework that helps individual investors identify those cases because we see individual investors systematically are more attracted to more speculative securities. Those lottery type of, lottery type of securities that come with the, you know, the, with the expectation, perhaps the exuberant expectation of these extreme payoffs, but on average, we see in the data that those investments typically don't work out well, very well. And as a result, individual investors typically end up losing their very hard earned life savings. And that's the last thing that we wanna see happening, okay? So that's module one to module four. As you'll see, each module will be building upon each other. Um, and we were gonna tell a story and the story will not be complete without Omri. So Omri, pick it up from here. Thank you, Panos. Uh, so I think what I'll just give a rough overview of my four modules and then we'll dive in into each one of them. But basically everything that Panos touched upon uh, before is gonna be relevant because at the end of the day, a lot of it has to do with the framework and understanding that a lot of times companies are mispriced or the timing is wrong. And also how do we apply you know, our knowledge now to understand that not all companies are gonna act the same. And I think what I wanna highlight here is that in, in the four modules that I'll be covering, and uh, we're gonna talk about the most core and trends in the market. Those are gonna be blockchain that Panos mentioned with cryptocurrencies. We're gonna talk about big and alternative data, which everyone talks about. Machine learning and artificial intelligence, which are also big phenomenon and taking a, a big portion now in, in, in the company's investment. And we're gonna summarize with FinTech, which is basically financial technology. Now, the main issue with any one of those trends and technologies is that you first need to understand how these technologies work. And like Panos mentioned, there's a frenzy around you know, cryptocurrencies, for example, but most people don't even understand the basic fundamental on how those technologies actually work. So in each one of the models that I'll be covering, each one of them will have a different type of technology. I will start by first, giving you an understanding of how they work. Then once we understand how they work, it's very important to understand that not all technologies are necessarily good. So there's definitely a lot of advantages, but there's also a lot of challenges that come with those. So once you have a better understanding of how the technology works and you better understand where the value is, it will give you a much better idea on in which cases this will be a good fit. For example, log texting, Blockchain technology would be a great fit for some companies, but not for others. Big data can solve issues in one area, but so not, not so much in another area. So we will see a lot of different examples and you will get to practice and kind of decide to yourself, okay, this company just announced that they're gonna use blockchain to solve something. Is it really gonna help, help them? So we're gonna analyze in which settings those different technologies are gonna be more helpful and useful for companies to really drive value. So whether you work in a company and thinking about implementing one of these technologies, whether you're interested in investing in such a company that applies those technologies or whether you wanna buy coins in a new initial coin offering, 
you'll, you'll be a lot better off once you've taken the course because we'll give you all the tools needed to make those informed decisions. We're not necessarily gonna tell you what to buy and how much to invest, but we're gonna give you the tools, as Fano said, to avoid mistakes, preserve your wealth, and make more informed decisions. So the first module that you see in the slide in front of you, we will basically cover blockchain. We will start with, you know, what is blockchain, how the technology, learn about the terminology in that. We will also talk about terms like smart contracts. And by the end of this course, what we'll do, we'll basically take all of the tools that we learn about this technology, the advantages and challenges that come with it. And we'll talk about different companies who decided to apply this technology and see whether it should be a good fit for them and analyze how it worked for them as well. In addition to talking about those issues, we'll also cover initial coin offerings. So there's a lot of coin investments in different digital currencies. So we will do the comparison between initial price offering, which private companies, when they become public, do to initial coin offerings. And that's kind of going to build of Panos because Panos is going to talk about IPOs in these modules, and I'm going to compare and contrast those with initial coin offerings and get a better understanding of you know, how the mechanism works and whether you should be participating or not. Um, let's move to the next module, please. Only uh, perhaps uh, if I may add uh, something that you said about you know not you know us not giving all the answers. I think that's really important because remember financial data analysis is a very dynamic exercise. It's things are happening every day, every second while the market is open. Things are happening. So so whatever we say today might be outdated within a day because new data is coming in, and that's really important because our business, our objective will be to give you a framework that can be dynamically updated as new data is coming in because that's the nature of the exercise. So we're not gonna be in the business of giving you all the answers because the answers will be changing as new data is, is coming in. Our objective is to give you a framework so that you can start asking the right questions. Because again, I don't even think that it's about the answer. It's about having a framework that will guide you to ask the right question. Once you formulate the question, the answer will be there for you. Right, and, and, and if we're talking about different technologies, you know, today it's blockchain and cryptocurrency, tomorrow is something else. But once you understand, okay, how's the framework to think about a new technology? What do I need to know? How do I get to know about the different challenges and thinking about whether this should work or not? You'll have a better idea once the new technology comes in the market and how to think about it. And I think that's kind of, how Panos and I are trying to frame everything. It's more about the way to critically analyze and gain an understanding so you'll make more informed decisions regardless of the situation that you'll face. And, and that could be either as an investor or even if you work in a company and you're presented with different opportunities either to implement in your own company, buy another company that, that uh, uh, aims to solve something. And I think those would be really, really relevant moving forward as well, even if they're not topics discussed in our class. So moving to module six, we're, we're going to move. Can you please uh, move, move forward with the slide? Thank you. We're going to talk about big and alternative data, which is something that everyone talks about today, right? And, and we see, especially in the Bay Area, there's more jobs in kind of being a data analyst and how does it work? So first of all, we need to, again, gain a better understanding of what is big data? What can we do with that? And whether it's, it's, it's going to be useful in certain cases versus others. And so we're going to talk about what types of alternative data are, are out there, especially for financial investors. And we'll also learn who's taking advantage of those big data, right? Panos already alluded to the fact that it's usually going to be the more sophisticated investors who have more resources, right? If you, if you have a big database that is very costly and also takes a lot of time to analyze, it's probably less likely that us as the individual retail investors would be able to enjoy and benefit from it. And that's going to change the, the entire dynamics in the market. Because now if there's new technology that comes in and only one portion or a portion of the investment community can utilize this technology, how does it affect the ones who cannot use and, and enjoy this technology? So this is going to be very relevant moving forward to understand markets are changing rapidly. And Panos, as Panos mentioned, right? every day is a new case, a new situation. For example, if you go back and you think about the AMC, right? This is 
th this is something that technology actually benefited maybe individual investors because they can come together now and, and make decision together and might have more resources than they did before when they couldn't ha have this technology could to kind of allow them to do so. Uh, and I think this is, this is why it's very important to understand how those technologies work and who utilize them and in what ways as well. So big data is definitely one of those cases. Panas, you wanted to add something? Yes, so um, while developing this program, uh, it, this program is actually very close to our hearts because it's very highly correlated with our research. So 80% actually of our time is not teaching, is actually doing research on these topics. And when it comes to big and alternative data, you know, Omer and I, we have done extensive work um, uh, in one of my papers, for example, we look at the introduction of satellite data, data of satellite imagery of parking lots for major retailers. And the question we're asking there is to what extent more data is necessarily improving the efficiency of capital markets if new data and big data is only accessible to a subset of very sophisticated investors who can use the data to front run the market at the expense of less, you know, less sophisticated individual investors, right? So, you know, with that in the background, right? So we live in a market setting where there is more technology, there is more data, but access to informed decision-making is actually getting less, uh, uh, um, uh, more constrained or less accessible. And I think that's why, one of the reasons why we believe that this program is important because um, uh, really there is the need to promote individual investor protection and make financial data analysis, even the analysis of big and alternative data more accessible to everyone, not just those who can afford to get access to the data, not only who are in finance, they have the financial acumen and expertise to process the data, but basically everyone. And that's true democratization of capital markets. Thank you, Panas. I'll just add a couple more things. So first of all, all of those technologies are gonna change markets in different ways. So we're also gonna touch upon those, whether financial information is now gonna be more accurate now that companies have more data, or maybe big data can help us reduce fraud because we're able to track and monitor and audit financial statements. So those are also gonna be incorporated throughout the course. But also you can see on the right side, there's always a box with the application exercise and what kind of uh, uh, practice cases you're gonna do and practice by yourself and, and we're gonna provide the solution for. So we're gonna also bring different databases that individual investors can use and see how those are gonna be beneficial, whether if you're working at a company and you're trying to identify different opportunities or whether you're an investor and you wanna utilize data in order to make more informed decisions. So those are also gonna be tailored into the program with different exercises al along the way. So moving to module seven now, in module seven, we're gonna discuss machine learning and artificial intelligence, which are pretty big and heavy topics. So of course we wanna have time to do a full, you can, you can spend months of learning machine learning and, and AI, but we're gonna do it in a way that is gonna summarize for you what are the main takeaways that you need to learn from those technologies in order to understand how they work. Because for most people, machine learning and artificial intelligence are black boxes. In fact, even for the government, in many of the times, they don't understand how, how companies, you know, whether it's Facebook or different lending companies, what kind of algorithms do they use in order to you know, elevate those technologies? So we'll first start by understanding those technologies better, especially in the field of financial investing. And once we understand those, we'll see how are th those are gonna be used into different settings of finance. And we're gonna provide, I'm gonna provide you with many different examples of current companies who use machine learning and AI applications. And then we're, done, we're gonna do the same exercise that we did with the other technology. Now that we understand the technology, we understand what advantages it can bring. And we also understand the challenges that come with it. We'll try and look at different settings and try to determine whether this is a setting that this technology can be more useful than others. And that's gonna be very helpful because if you think about companies today, you wanna to understand, okay, I understand there's those different technologies, but I don't really understand which, which companies are gonna benefit more from those technologies and really elevate uh, their product or their services into a different level. And, and what we're seeing now in the market is, you know, most of the rise in the stock market has been due to those different technologies, especially in the high-tech industry. 
Uh, and then you can see again the application exercise. You'll evaluate, for example, how PayPal or other firms are using these advanced machine learning algorithms to really have an effective investment outcome. And as investors, this is going to be really useful to understand how companies are able to shift completely their operation by implementing some of those technologies. The last module, module eight, that we're going to talk about is, is probably going to touch upon all of the other stuff as well, but we're going to talk about fintech. Uh, and I'm going to lead you through the past, the history, and how fintech actually started and what caused it uh, to happen. Then we're going to talk about some present trends that we're seeing. And then we're going to move to the future and going to see how fintech is actually impacting all of us in our daily lives and how companies are really transforming into this space. So just to give you a small example, and I assume you're seeing it in the market today, which we haven't seen Five years ago, we're seeing a big, a big movement from working with traditional banks to working with fintech companies that basically now provide a big portion of the credit in the U.S. market. And those fintech companies that are the, our current lenders, they also elevate machine learning and AI algorithms. So all of those topics are going to be basically summarized in module eight once we'll introduce fintech as, as a new topic. And we're going to do it in two different ways, both from the perspective of companies and using this technology and how they can really elevate their game and what in, in what companies this makes more sense and more beneficial, but also as investors in understanding the current market trends and changes that are happening, and especially market powers in the market. So who benefits from it? And how can we, as individual investors, can use some of those fintech technologies and companies to really elevate the way that we make investments. So for example, there's a lot of new companies in the market now, if it's Acorns, Coinbase, Robinhood, that really allow us you know, to, to do stuff that we weren't able to do before, to gain more information, to do more maybe efficient trading. So those, you know, for example, automated managed portfolios that are also based on machine learning and AI algorithms. And those are stuff that weren't available to retail investors and also very important for you to, to learn and know about. Uh, and I think this kind of summarizes our eight modules. One other thing I wanna mention in the next slide, please, is that we're gonna use some of the most current companies in the market right now. So we're gonna give examples both from very large public companies that you all know about, such as Tesla, Apple, Snapchat, Tiffany, and more. But there's also going to be a lot of small examples that you probably haven't heard about before. And some companies are doing really smart and innovative things that I, we think are important to learn about. So you'll get a mix of everything, you know, from private companies to public companies to companies who use different technologies to blockchain. And, and Panos and I really, we invested a lot of time to make sure that by the end of it, you'll get the necessary tools to make informed decisions wherever you go and in whatever position you are currently in your life and your job and everything. And hopefully, you know, you'll get to enjoy it and make, you know, smarter decisions moving forward. When it comes to the, some of the applications, only if I may add, the idea would be, or the, at least the, the way we approach financial data analysis, yeah, at the end of the day, data is a way to tell stories, right? So. So think of this as a framework that is using data to tell stories. And a lot of what's happening at the marketplace is people's beliefs in action. Uh, so for example, for the case of Tesla, we're gonna start with the historical data of the company, the accounting data, and then we're gonna try to use the data to help tell the story behind the stock price of Tesla in real time. So in other words, we're gonna look at the stock price of Tesla in real time, and we're gonna try to reverse engineer the story behind the press, what needs to happen in terms of fundamentals, in terms of sales and profitability for that price to be justified, and then try to challenge that price and try to tell our own story. Uh, so in many ways, financial data analysis is a storytelling framework, and we're gonna try to see the story uh, behind the, the numbers and also tell the story with numbers. Okay, so moving to the next slide, please. Thanks, Marie, you, you can take it from here. 
I do. I think this is where I step back into the frame and talk a little bit more about those tactical or operational components of being in the program. But firstly, just thank you to both of you um, for being here with us uh, and taking us through that curriculum. Here on your screen, we're highlighting for you some of the components of the learning experience. You'll see uh, this program includes recorded videos. There are live sessions. These are synchronous learning opportunities, a chance for you uh, to come in into a live session such as this one and learn directly from faculty. There's also live office hours which is where you can turn on your video and your audio and speak to your learning facilitators in the program. So you have that larger ecosystem at Berkeley you have program support. You have your course faculty who you've heard from today at the helm of your learning. And then a, la a layer within that are your learning facilitators. And these are industry experts who have been vetted and called into the program to be there with you on your day-to-day -day experience. They host your live office hours. They give you feedback on your assignments. They're on the discussion boards, helping to push your thinking and drive up engagement. Um, so you have that layer of teaching support as well. And then a layer in from there is your peers. Uh, your peer network is a, a huge part of your learning and you'll see um, lots of different opportunities for you to interact with your peers, to learn together with and from one another. Uh, your peer cohort is gonna represent many different geographies, many different years of work experience or tenure levels, different industry backgrounds. So a really rich opportunity for you to um, access a tapestry of ideas um, as you make your way through the learning with your peers. So you'll see there are discussion boards, crowdsourced activities, demonstrations, case studies, knowledge checks, polls, assignments, pre-readings, all of this really developed to ensure that you get the very best learning experience possible in the program. So we wanted to call your attention to some of these features here um, as you make your way through, um, as you make your way through learning more about this program and what you can expect. I would say uh, many different layers of support uh, for those of you who are looking to have an interactive and highly engaging experience. Um, so those subject matter experts, those learning facilitators, again, they answer your questions, they give you feedback on, a, on assignments, they're integral to your learning, um, and, and a big part of what you'll be doing is going into office hours and bringing your questions in, or perhaps you have a niche area of interest, can I apply this um, in an in a educational environment for children? So these kind of niche areas or peripheral questions are a great thing for you to bring to office hours to speak with your learning facilitators about um, and, and to dive deeply into these different areas of interest during, uh, during the office hour sessions. So with that, let's move on. This is a summary slide to give you a little bit more information about what you can expect. Uh, we call this bite-sized learning, which is a chance for you to learn as you go. Um, unlike a traditional classroom environment where you're constrained by space and by time, you have a certain amount of seats and a certain amount of time to get through the curriculum. In the online context, uh, you don't have those constraints, so you're really able to learn a concept fully simmer with it through the assignments, quizzes, peer learning discussions, live teaching sessions, uh, get the most out of it before then moving on to the next concept. So that's how we've designed the program. Uh, we release content every single week and you have four to six hours um, is, is what we estimate it will take for you to get through the content across the two months. So four to six hours per week um, across two months of content. That four to six hours is yours to design around your schedule. Um, most of the most of the learning can be can be um, asynchronous. It can be uh, covered on your own schedule. And any of the live sessions, the office hours, and faculty webinars are recorded and put into the platform for your review if you have to miss those. And um, with that, we've reached our last and final slide. You'll see there's a link on your screen. Uh, that link will take you over to the enrollment page where you can register for the program. But more importantly, once you put in your details on the enrollment page, you'll be connected with a one-on-one -on -one program advisor we have here with us. So if you go to the enrollment page and you put in your details, the very next thing that will happen is a member of the advising team who's here with us today um, will pick up the phone and give you a call, send you an email and get connected. Uh, you will then work one-on-one -on -one with your program advisor between now and the time the course begins uh, to help get any questions answered and to help ensure that you have everything that you need. Now, if you're not quite ready to put in your contact details into that enrollment page, we also have an email address that's berkeley at emeritus.org. You can simply send an email there to berkeley at emeritus.org. 
org. Let us know you need an advisor and we'll match you up that way. So a lot of different channels to get you connected, but our program advisors really are the course foremost experts when it comes to all of the logistics for the program. When are those live sessions scheduled? What time zone are they in? All of the course policy information. How do I earn that certificate of completion? What's the evaluative criteria for the program? And then all of the registration and enrollment questions. Um, how do I apply? Are there flexible payment options or special group enrollment pricing? All of that information, your advisor will be able to help you with as well. So certainly click on the link or send an email, get connected with an advisor. We want to make sure you have a mentor uh, and, a, and a place to go for any questions as, as you prepare to join the program. I'm going to invite our professors back into the frame here. Um, so one of the things that 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 I was hoping we could sort of start with here is related to the industry um, expertise. I, I noticed on one of the slides we don't we don't need experience um, before joining this program in the in this topic. So for those of us who might have little to no experience at all, um, is this program going to be a good fit for us? And then on the other side of that, on that scale of tenure, what if we do have experience? Are we gonna, is this going to be a deep enough dive uh, for mid career professionals or for professionals who do have um, a little bit of prerequisite knowledge? in this area. Um, so Panos, I'm going to pitch it over to you. So just in terms of tenure, uh, who did you have in mind when the program was designed? I mean, at the onset of the program, we really had in mind individual investors uh, that are looking for an intelligent investment decision framework. Um, but based on my experience with executive education over the last several years, what I realized is that even people in finance that have, you know, presumably years of experience in the financial sector, uh, they typically find the framework extremely relevant because it's quite unique. It's based on our research, it's based on kind of, you know, latest developments, and it's kind of a, a new perspective on looking, uh, uh, looking at data. Um, so I think, you know, the primary audience is individual investors, but I think anybody, regardless of their degree of financial sophistication, uh, will benefit from a program like that. I'll just add that it, it's so yeah, it's mainly kind of to investors who want to enhance their knowledge and gain more tools. But also, if you work in a company, you could also find it very useful because you're going to run into different decisions that you have to make that are that we're going to talk about in the class. Whether it's investments in other companies, whether it's implementing different technologies. So the framework to think about it, okay, what are the benefits to my company based on my firm characteristics are also gonna be very useful for you. Uh, when you think about those decisions at the firm level. So not only from outside the company, making investments into companies and in the market, but also if you're situated in a company and you can be in every level, right? If you, even if you're not a decision maker, but there's core and processes that are happening in your company. For example, if you're gonna, you know, employ some big data and big data is something that every company now talks about. You want to understand the terminology to understand the benefits of this, uh, this adaptation and the challenges will, that will come with it. So just to be a more engaged and active uh, member of the company, I think you will also find those very useful frameworks and settings to, to, to learn about. I know you've answered it already, but it might be helpful for the broader audience. Are we going to cover technical analysis and stock screening? So to what degree do we incorporate data analysis themes uh, throughout the program? Yeah, so that's a, that's a very good question. Um, so uh, that's actually going to happen early on in the program when we talk about conditions of mispricing. That is, you know, under what circumstances the market is more likely to get it wrong, right? Because really screening for ideas boils down to screening for cases where prices are more likely to deviate from value. Uh, so that's the essence of screening. And that's actually gonna happen early on in the program, finding ways, creative ways to use data to screen the universe of companies for interesting ideas, potentially mispriced securities that can lead to excellent investment opportunities, right? Uh, so we're definitely covering that. In terms of technical analysis, technical analysis is quite different from stock screening because you can screen the universe in different ways. Technical analysis sometimes refers to kind of chasing trends, right? And reading charts. Uh, we're gonna sort of touch upon those issues, uh, but uh, uh, the core of our analysis will be hardcore um, uh, screening using uh, variables um, uh, intersecting a little bit of technical analysis 
uh, but we're not gonna get too much into the depth of technical analysis. Um, our research shows that technical analysis is very hard to sort of make it work in an out of sample fashion. Uh, there's a couple of variables that matter and we'll talk about those, uh, but we're not gonna be so much in the business of technical analysis. We will analyze data in, uh, in very structural ways. We'll talk about stock screening, but technical analysis is, is not so much within the scope of the program, right Omri? Yes, I, I agree. I, I would also mention, I think one of the things and, and Thanos, uh, Thanos uh, touched upon it at, at the very early beginning is that at the end of the day, it's not only, okay, so we're gonna get all the, the information that we need to make our own valuation, but what we're gonna focus more is, okay, how do we compare what we're thinking with what the market is currently thinking and try to see you know, whether we have some advantage or think differently from the market? Because if we're thinking the same and prices already reflect what everyone else is thinking, which is similar to us, we're not actually gonna benefit from that. So I think in terms of, yeah, we're not gonna do and touch technical analysis too much, but it is gonna be relevant in the sense that how you value a company and also understanding the market forces that are happening currently and trying to see whether you have a better information or you think differently than the market and make decisions based on that and also avoid very common mistakes that are happening all the time with, with many different investments and different trends uh, like Panos mentioned with the meme stock and some other stuff as well. So in other words, we're gonna to try to see through the noise because sometimes the technicals are affected by noise. Our objective is to sort of take a very hard look at the data through a, in a very structured way and try to sort of see through the noise and try to make sense of what might be happening, right? So in a way, um, um, uh, we're not, um, you know, we're gonna exploit trends and deviations that may happen because of technicals. Uh, but at the core of it will be uh, a fundamental based approach. Do we talk about the foreign exchange market at all? Is this something that is incorporated into the program? Uh, uh, the, the, the duration of the program is only two months, right? So we can't really cover everything in great detail. But as I mentioned, the framework is comprehensive and deep enough to accommodate any business class, uh, any asset class, I'm sorry, from you know plain vanilla stocks to bonds to digital assets all the way to, to, to currencies, right? Uh, but we're not gonna be able to sort of provide a course on foreign exchange trading. So I don't wanna disappoint you, right? But I think it's important to set the expectations, right? But if the question is, are you gonna learn? I think yes, uh, but it's not gonna be so much about, it's, it's not a program specialized on Forex. Omri Panos, with any final words, uh, thoughts, uh, advice uh, that you'd like to share with participants who are considering joining the program. Uh, Panos, we'll start with you. Omri, we'll, we'll go over to you next. Um, so any final thoughts to share as we say goodbye? Well, I mean, regardless of whether you join the program or not, financial data analysis matters and matters increasingly more over time and access to financial education matters. So do take your financial education seriously, regardless of your professional and academic background. So that would be my advice. And now it's really up to you whether you, you know, it's going to be a program or something else, but do definitely take your uh, financial acumen seriously. So I would just finish uh, by thanking everyone for joining us today and uh, sitting here for the last hour. And then like Panos mentioned, you know, we, what we care about is kind of educating and helping others and making more uh, you know, sound financial decisions whether it's with our program or just other material that you can find, you know, just take advantage of that and, and you know, try to really learn because uh, sometimes it just, you know, we see different trends and mispricing and we're, we're just worried about many, many retail and different investors, you know, being taken advantage in, in different situations. So I would, again, support you to take it seriously for yourself and uh, thank you again for, for joining us. Uh, we want to thank each and every one of you, especially you, uh, our, our keynote professors, for being here with us. Um, and to all of you who've joined from across the globe, thank you as well. It's been, uh, it's been a real pleasure spending this last hour with each and every one of you. And we hope to see you all again in the program beginning just around the corner. Um, with that, we sign off with a heartfelt good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good day to all of you from around the globe. Thanks again for joining today. Mm -hmm.